comes to everyone and this is the how to play series this time featuring Salt and Sanctuary. If you haven't heard of Salt and Sanctuary then here's a quick explanation of what it is. Actually chances are if you're watching this video you already know what this game is but even so Salt and Sanctuary is basically if Dark Souls was made as a 2D action RPG with a lot of platforming and some metroidvania-esque mechanics. It is heavily inspired by Dark Souls and Castlevania as you can probably tell and has received positive reception from critics. The game also features 2D hand-drawn visuals and again gameplay mechanics similar to the Souls series. Remember when I said Hollow Knight is kinda like if Dark Souls and Mario fused into one? Yeah, that was a horrible example. This is kind of like that with a lot more death, blood, and gore. Like Castlevania in a lot more salt, literally. And so to help you guys, if those who are planning to try this game for yourselves, I made this video. The rules, the guidelines, or simply the do's and don'ts. This is... Like I said, Salt and Sanctuary is a 2D action role-playing video game developed and published by Ska Studios. The game was released on March 15, 2016 for the PlayStation 4 and was later released on the PC, Mac, Linux, PlayStation Vita, and Nintendo Switch. The game is widely considered as the 2D Dark Souls and I agree. I know like I'm saying Dark Souls a lot but bear with me. The game features hundreds of items that the player can use, several weapon categories, special movesets from said weapon categories, the ability to block, roll, and parry, cast spells, use bows, Starting origins, gifts, classes, and stat development. As well as one of the most extensive skill trees I have ever seen in a role-playing game, providing hundreds of combinations. The game also features multiplayer features, mainly co-op and a new game plus mode. It also gives you the ability to help or mess with other people online playing the same game as you. Honestly, the latter being more fun. If that doesn't scream Dark Souls, I don't know what does. The cool thing about it is the whole game was created by only two individual people, including all of the designing choices and most of the artworks found in the game. Actually, all of the artwork found in the game. But enough of that, what you do care about is a beginner's guide video on Salt and Sanctuary. And I'm just gonna put it out there that I played the game a bunch of times and has beaten the game twice. Once to record the game and to re-record it again because I kind of lost the footage of my first playthrough. Anyways, let's get started. If you haven't played any of the Dark Souls games, then here's what you need to know. It's an RPG. You collect souls each time you kill a monster, or in this case, salts, and then you use those salts to level up and upgrade gear. You explore maps, acquire items, fight more monsters, until you complete an area usually with a really big and or difficult boss battle hidden in a specific zone of the map. Sometimes it's huge, sometimes it's fast, most of the time both at the same time. And that's it. And all you'll die. Like a lot. And when you die, you lose all those salts and the percentage of gold you receive during the playthrough. And no salts means you can't level up, and if you can't level up, then that would equate into you losing all that time you spent collecting all those salts in the first place. Now, I know what you're thinking, just try not to die, right? I mean, it's a 2D RPG, how hard could it possibly be, right? <laughs> no, you can't just not die, the game is extremely difficult and sometimes might even seem unfair to new players and even some experienced players. But oddly enough, it's a really effective mechanic that keeps the player base high and asking for more of this Dark Souls-esque games. It's fun, it's brutal, and it's also satisfying to play. Let's start with character creation, because, you know, where else should we start? At character creation, you'll be asked to choose from a series of starting classes. Although I'm not going to go over the classes too much as the classes themselves don't really make that much of an impact on your character. It just sets what sort of skills and equipment your character is gonna have at the start of the game. Whether you pick warrior or mage, it wouldn't really matter unless you have some sort of build that you have in mind. In both my playthroughs, I started with a pauper class, which is basically a jobless class having no skills and mediocre equipment. I highly advise that you don't do this if this is your first playthrough of a Dark Souls as game. In fact, I advise that if you are gonna pick a class, pick a class that you know you're gonna be sticking to until the end of the game. Still, again, whichever class you pick, it wouldn't really matter in the end, you can start as a mage and end the game as an archer if you want to. So don't think about the starting classes too much, if you're really not sure what to pick, take the warrior since for me, it's the simplest and easiest one out of the bunch. 
After class selection, you'll be asked to pick a starting gift. You can choose from multiple gifts, which are all useful to some extent. But after 3-4 to four hours playing a game, depending on how quickly you can go through the game, chances are you would already have every single one of those starting gifts in hand, acquiring them from all sorts of places in the map. Whichever one you pick is completely up to you. Personally, again, it wouldn't really matter after some time what you pick, and as such, I would just recommend you just get the Grasping Ring. After that, customize your character how you see fit. Male, female, doesn't matter, whichever origin you pick also wouldn't matter. Once you actually get into the game, you'll find yourself in some sort of ship. Things happen and then you get washed up on some sort of island. Now, this island will be the entirety of the game. Everything else that will happen soon after will take place on this island. You're free to explore wherever you wish, but since this is a Metroidvania, Dark Souls, Castlevania-esque game, you'll be forced to stay in specific zones of the map until you get the brands needed to advance from one zone to another. More on that later. Enemy strength is static, so if you find some of the monsters too much or just too difficult to kill, chances are you're not supposed to be there yet. And all zones of the map are all interconnected in some sort of way, and there are certain shortcuts that you can use to go through from one part of the map to another. But if you are gonna do that, make sure that you've leveled up enough so you won't die as quickly when you get there. Let's talk about the UI and the basic combat stats. This is your health bar or just health, the amount of life that the player has. If you get hit by an enemy or if you drop down from a high vantage point, you will lose health. The player will die when it reaches zero. Pretty basic stuff if you didn't already know what this is. I'm really concerned why you pick Salt and Sanctuary as your first action game. This is the stamina bar, or just stamina. Much like an action bar, this determines the amount of actions that the player can do before having you let it recharge. This includes attacking, spellcasting, rolling, and using your shield. Basically, almost every action that your character can do, well, except for jumping. Focus works as your magic bar or your mana. It's like your action bar, but it depletes when you use spells, prayers, miracles, and incantations. Unlike stamina, it does not replenish on its own, but can be replenished with items or at a sanctuary. It's a little hard to see, but it's the white bar below your stamina. Also, as your focus gets depleted, you will slowly get fatigue, lowering your maximum stamina until you rest at a sanctuary or use an item. Attack is the amount of damage that the player will do with equipped weapon. The higher the stat you have for your weapon, the higher the damage you can deal with said weapon. More on that later. Drop rate is the rate at which items are likely to drop from enemies upon killing them. Increasing this stat will increase the probability of item drops. And finally, equip is the stat that represents how much the player can carry before he is overburdened. The higher the equip stat, the lighter your character can feel, and as such, you'll move more quicker and more fluid. Wait, did I just say more quicker? Back to the island, through a series of bottled messages, the game will tell you the basic mechanics of the game. Some of them you'll learn on your own, and some you'll learn from other players. Again, via those bottled messages. Keep an eye out on those, as most of those messages are really helpful for new players. Although, don't take everything there too seriously, as sometimes some of them are really just made to mess with other people. The first area is the Shivering Shore and the Festering Benquay. Benquay? Benquet. Benquet is simple enough, it's pretty straightforward and the game will let you know what you need to know. I do highly recommend though that before you even leave this area is that you reach level 5 at the very least. The enemies in the succeeding zones will be harder than the next so it's a good idea to keep on advancing at least 5 levels for each zone of the map. Also, hidden in every area most of the time at the far end of each zone is a very challenging boss battle. A good way to know if you're close to a boss battle is to keep an eye out on these things. If you see this, then what comes after would most definitely be some sort of boss battle. Be sure you've leveled up neatly before undergoing on such battles and that you've done your absolute best to explore the whole zone. Again, that might not be possible since some areas might be locked until you get the specific brand to go through them, but at least you're going through the fight knowing you've done everything else there is to do and you can just come back later when you receive the appropriate brand. Speaking of leveling up, this will be your main way of reaching such feats. This is the Salt and Sanctuary skill tree, or what the game calls it, the tree of skill. But to make it easier for me, I'll just call it the skill tree. The tree is semi-divided into magic, mainly for mages, dexterity for hunters and thieves, strength for warrior types, endurance for heavy armor dudes, and fate for characters that use prayers. Now, this is what you're going to be looking at the whole game every time you level up your stats. Be sure that before you even invest a point on your skills is that you fully have an idea on what sort of character you're planning to build. The skill tree may be a bit too overpowering to new players, but that's okay, it's all part of the learning system. Also from this point on, when I say skill point, what I meant to say is the black pearl that you receive each time you level up. And to make sure you won't do any critical mistakes while leveling, I'll try my best to explain what each of the main stats do, including all the skills found in the tree. Feel free to pause on any specific point in the video, as I'll go through this with as much information as quickly as I can. 
Now throughout the skill tree, you'll find what I call class skills. Being a very open-ended class system in an RPG, Salt and Sanctuary made a very fine job in giving the player the chance to mix up certain classes. While I do believe that the game itself already explains the class skills perfectly, for the purpose of this video, I'll try my best to list out and explain what each of the class skills do. Also take note that I only beat in the game twice, once as a two-handed warrior with full heavy armor and secondly as a spell sword who also uses heavy armor but with a dexterity and magic based build. Why did I tell you this? Uh, I don't know, it felt like something I should say. The sword fighter skills of course lets you use swords. Most of the overpowered weapons in the game uses the strength build or more often than not uses swords as their main weapon. This is why I said if you don't know which class to pick, take the warrior. This class is, 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 is okay, that's this is Okay, I'm just gonna skate I'm just gonna say skill, okay? Okay. This skill also lets you use a very OP and easy to acquire great sword that you can equip and beat the whole game with. More on that later. Pikeman lets you use pole axes, reapers, and spears. The range of these weapons can help you considerably when it comes to flying enemies that are hard to reach. It can also help by hitting multiple enemies at once. Hunter lets you use whips. Now, I'm not really sure how effective whips are in this game, but I have seen a lot of people have fun and use this weapon effectively as long as you know and understand what your whip can and cannot do, movesets and all. They do however go well with crossbows and guns as I've seen in many playthroughs. The Archer class skills of course lets you use bows. I personally think that the bows in this game are made as secondary weapons as opposed to being your main weapon. They're good at damaging enemies at a distance but the aiming mechanic and the damage itself is not really something you can rely on on big boss fights. Although like I could be wrong, if you manage to make it work tell me in the comment section below. The Marksman skill lets you use crossbows and pistols. Like the bow, they're good secondary weapons and some of them are great as an offhand weapon. I do like to remind everyone that like bows, they might not be as perfect against specific bosses, although they're very much OP in certain situations. The assassin skill revolves around using daggers. While they do have a very short range, they can be used effectively if you know what you're doing. They are very fun to play with and can recover quickly mid-combo. Thanks to the speed and weight of this weapon, it's very easy to execute combos to quickly dispatch an enemy and are best used with a ranged offhand weapon because of the added mobility it brings. This skill lets you equip higher tiered shields. That's it, that's all I got. The Berserker gives you the ability to use hammers and axes. While I do recommend just using a sword when it comes to strength builds, if you however wish to roleplay with an axe and or a hammer, they are also effective when it comes to pure damage output. It's the same with the Berserker but with the two-handed versions of the hammers and axes. They can be very slow but mix up for it with its semi-increased range and the ability to instantly destroy an enemy with 1-2 to two hits. Allows you to use staves. Staves? Staves. Sta- Hmm. Hmm. And the chance to use what I believe is the most OP weapon in the game when it comes to ranged damage output. One of these ones get some Magus class skills. These are perfect as an offhand weapon for hybrid builds using magic. Take this if you want to use spells and incantations. Take this if you want to use prayers. Take this if you plan on wearing light armor. And this if you want heavy armor. Light armor for mobility and heavy armor for damage reduction. You can mix and match different class skills if you want. You can be a heavy armor staff wielding mage or be a two-handed light armor wearing samurai. This is completely up to you as long as you're happy, you'll do fine. Although again, I do suggest that you just stick with one or two attributes if this is your first playthrough. Still, again, if you think you know what you're doing, do what you want to do. You can just create another character from scratch if you need to. Now that you know the core mechanics of the game, what to keep in mind, the class skills, and what your character can and cannot do, Let's talk about everything else in the game. Salts and gold, or more importantly, salts, is the main currency of the game. Every time you level up and upgrade gear, the game will require you to give up a number of salts. The higher you level up or the better the gear you're using, the more salts you will have to spend. Gold, on the other hand, is less important as this is only used to buy items from merchants scattered and hidden in the world. You automatically gain this from killing enemies and can also be spent on sanctuary NPCs. Speaking of Sanctuary, Sanctuaries are those safe havens that the character can go through to save the game, replenish stats, and level up. This is also where you'll find most if not all merchants that will sell you items or upgrades for your gear. Kneeling on a Sanctuary will respawn every single enemy in the game and will treat the last Sanctuary that you kneeled at as your respawn point. Now this is a key feature and a core mechanic in all Soulsborne games. Sanctuaries are always themed after a specific creed and the upgrades and gear that you get from the Sanctuary will relate themselves to whatever creed they are based on. There are 7 creeds 
breeds present in the game and for spoiler free reasons and because I don't want to make this video any longer than it needs to, I will sadly not go over this on this video. I personally think that it's far better for the player to figure this stuff on your own as most of the story you'll get from the game are found in the little details of the environment or from the stories that the NPCs will often share with you. It's actually your job to fit these key story pieces on your own if you want to figure out the game's overall story. There are two ways you can upgrade your gear. One is to bring your gear to a friendly blacksmith and pay him to upgrade the gear for you, which would boost up its stats and its effectiveness as long as you have the required amount of salt and a specific number of material items. More on that later. And the second one is to transmute the item into a different item altogether, resulting in a far more superior item, with different stats and different special effects, or even special movesets. Although sometimes transmuting won't really bring out a better item, however, and as such, I would recommend just checking the stats of what your item will turn into before performing the transmutation. The effectiveness of the weapon will rely on each of the weapon's stat scale, S, A, B, C, D, E. Each weapon has different stat scalings, S being the highest and E being the lowest. Obviously, the higher the stat scale, the more the weapon will use that stat as its attack multiplier. If this is getting too confusing, just know that the higher the scaling, the more damage it would probably deal. Again, it's completely up to you how you wish to experiment on this. Later on the tips and tricks section, I'll list out some good weapon selections you can use for the early game and some for the end game. Prayers and spells is the alternative way of dealing damage rather than using weapons. Their effectiveness depend on your wisdom and magic stat respectively, as I've said before, and will require their associated class skill. You'll find the skills along the skill tree. The simpler the skill, the closer the skill is at the center of the tree. If you need a far more greater skill, you must build it up until you reach your chosen skill. These skills require more skill points in order to unlock, and as such, I recommend only getting the skills you plan on using, as wasting skill points in this game is a horrible, horrible idea. There are multiple prayers and spells in the entire game and all of them are effective in their own special way. However, I do admit that some prayers and spells are far superior than the others but that kinda depends on your playstyle. Okay, we're almost done with the how to play section of the video. I just have to go over a few things and those are brands. Brands are special skills or what I would call movement abilities that you acquire while playing the game. Some brands let you jump farther, some brands let you go through block passages, and some, some are just weird. Like I said, you will acquire these brands while playing the game which will let you access hidden parts of a specific zone of the map. I highly advise that whenever you get a new brand is that you revisit some of the unreachable locations you've encountered while playing the game. Most of the time, that brand is the key way of reaching that location to begin with and most of the time, there's a shortcut, item, and gear set found in these hidden locations. With that said, on with the tips and tricks section of the video. Don't be afraid to replay the game from the start if you messed up building your character. I personally do this every time I play an RPG. To me, RPGs are a learning experience. In fact, if you replay the game from the start, you'll start to build your character better since you already know what each of the main stats and skills do. You will die. Dying is a part of the game unless you're some sort of extreme expert about the game, you will die. Actually, even then, there's still a good chance that you'll die quickly and unfairly, but that's fine if you do die. Don't make it out of nothing and try to turn all your deaths into a learning experience. Experience. Whenever you do that, you will lose all your salts and will turn itself into a flying bat-like creature with all your salts. The best way to retake your salts is to go back where you've died and kill this creature. If you die before that, all your salts will permanently disappear. If you get killed by something else, your remaining salts will go to the monster that killed you and reclaiming all those salts will require you to kill that monster. As much as possible, whenever you have enough salts, always consume them outright, whether to level up or upgrade gear. Hoarding salts is much too risky for this game and it's completely unadvisable to do so. If you have salts, just use them. At some point in the game, the enemies will start to overpower you. When this happens, it's a good idea to go back to the last zone that you were at and start farming salts to level up. You will often have to backtrack to your sanctuary to level up, which would also result in you respawning every single enemy in the game. There is absolutely no pausing in this game. If you need to do something quick, you may need to find a safe place to leave your character while you do what you have to do. Try to focus on leveling only one or two at the very least weapon scaling stats as much as possible. If you plan on being a mage, focus on magic. Assassin, go dexterity. Do not level up three or more weapon scaling stats as that will broaden your skills too much and will cause you to have a very, very hard time towards the end game. 
If you're new, focus on one. If you know what you're doing, go with two. But still, if you're a complete beginner, just focus on one. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Don't think about which class you're gonna start off too much as it just determines which skills and equipment you'll start with the game. If you have a particular build in mind, then go with the class closest to what you plan on creating. You really don't need to complete a specific division of a skill tree. Just pick what you need and then just level up your existing skill points. You can only add up to three skill points in a specific skill however, so keep that in mind. You can only equip two weapon sets within a given playthrough. You can't use them both at the same time, meaning you will have to switch weapon sets whenever you need to use a different weapon. This is already explained in the tutorial, but I feel like I still need to include this here. Keep your quick slot bar as short as possible. Using an atom will momentarily pause any sort of movement for your character. This will result in a massive vulnerability to incoming attacks, so make sure you only use atoms that you absolutely need to use. Clean up your inventory ever so often. It may not look as much, but this is a massive tip in all RPGs. Sometimes you don't really need every single thing in your inventory and that they're better off being sold for currency so you can acquire some more precious upgrades. Speaking of inventory, the ring slots within your inventory are of course used to slot in rings. Rings add special bonuses for your character such as increased damage, reduced focus cost, and gradual HP regeneration. You can only slot in 4 rings at the same time so plan out your build accordingly. Charms are special equipment items that grant a player passive bonuses to their weapons when equipped. There are nice additions for your build and can help a lot as long as you use the appropriate charm. There are 16 charms in the game and most of them can be easily acquired just by exploring. Picking whether to use a wand or a staff only matters when it comes to how you handle combat. Wands can only be used as an offhand weapon and staffs can be considered two-handed weapons. In addition to spell casting, staffs can parry and block and wands can only shoot out spells. Using multiple red shards will cause your health to regenerate faster. Red shards does not refill itself at the sanctuary however and activating them only happens once. Weapon imbues are consumable items that can be used to imbue weapons with a secondary elemental damage. They are scattered around the world but most of them can be bought from sanctuary merchants as long as you have their respective breed. While playing the game, you will encounter items such as bags of salt and suitcases of salt. These are containers of salt and they… well they contain salt. Use them and you gain salt. Material items are unique items that are dropped by enemies and the more special ones are dropped by bosses. You need these material items to properly upgrade your gear or to completely transmute an item into a different item. Adam is a really hard thing to keep on saying, holy shit. Okay. Torches can be used to light up specific areas that are too dark to see. I'm not really sure which key button lights up torches on keyboards, but for controllers, they're usually the down key on the D-pad. As promised, there's a good selection of weapons used for the early game and some for the end game. If you really want to beat this game badly for strength builds, I recommend the Jaws of Death. For magic builds, I recommend Shiara's Staff. Tachi is one of the best weapons for dex builds, but sadly, when it comes to wisdom builds, I'm not really informed enough to give out a recommendation. If you guys know some good weapon selections, tell everyone in the comment section below. I would like to say that these are the best weapons only in my opinion. That does not mean they truly are the best. I only beat in the game twice. I'm only suggesting these weapons because that's what I've heard of the most when I research about this game. I do stand my ground on the Jaws of Death however, they dish out too much damage considering how early you can get them. Dodge, Roll, Jump, Block, and Parry. Combat in this game is very tactile and fluid. Practice on using your time parries and blocks while in combat and use your dodges and rolls. You'll save a lot more time this way instead Instead of having to go back to your sanctuary to reset your health and saves you the hassle of using your already limited health poultices. When rolling, you are invincible to damage for a short window of time. You can roll through enemies if you are close enough to them when you initiate a roll. Every time you kneel on a sanctuary, you will receive a number of health poultices. You can use these health poultices to, of course, gain back health. Be careful when you use this item, however, as they are very limited and makes you vulnerable when in the process of drinking one. Parrying at the precise moment an enemy is going to attack opens them up for a repost. Repost? Repost. Is that how you pronounce it? Attacking while this is active will give you invincibility frames and a cool animation. You can also do this when you break an enemy's guard or deal enough damage to them. Weapons all have different combos and attack animations, and experimenting on this is a huge factor when it comes to deciding which weapon to go with. With that said, find a weapon that you love and stick with it. In Salt and Sanctuary, you'll start to discover different types of weapons. This could be spears, swords, hammers, bows, daggers, and many more. You might be tempted to use as many as 3 or more weapons, but I strongly advise not doing this and just find a weapon that has good weapon scaling along with a special moveset that you enjoy. Later on, you'll be able to upgrade your weapon with souls and a material atom. Material atoms are really difficult to come by and as such, it's recommended that you upgrade one or two weapons the whole game. 
Each set of armor has their own elemental and physical resistance, and since each zone of the map has different types of enemies within them, it may be a good idea to switch armor sets if necessary. If an item has a red X on it, then it's safe to say that you can't use that item. This is mostly true for armors and weapons. This usually happens because the player character does not have the minimum requirement to use that weapon or armor. Spells are used as ammo and will not run out. To use a spell, you must equip a staff or a wand and the preferred spell must be placed on your ammo slot on your offhand. Incantations and prayers on the other hand are slotted in below the item slot bar and can be used anytime even without a staff or a wand. Elemental imbalance is displayed as a bar on top of your screen. Spells with the same element cannot be used successively without any negative effects. Using multiple fire skills at once causes your character to receive damage. Same with other elemental spells and incantations. If you plan on being a mage, always alternate spells so that your elemental imbalance can remain as low as possible. You can use the Link of Fire and Sky Ring to complete negate elemental imbalance, allowing you to use succeeding spells and incantations of the same element. Prayers and miracles are used much like incantations. If you plan on using them, place them on the slot under the item bar of your inventory. Inventory? Inventory. Two-handing can still parry and block, although not as effective. Mages can use swords too, just use magic scaling weapons. Two-handing a weapon will also increase your total equipment load. The more you get damaged, the more wounded you can get. Wounding is a special debuff that gives your health bar and stamina a short cap. You can't regenerate past this point. Always use one stone guide for every sanctuary that you visit. Not only does this boost up item drop rate, but it also allows you to fast travel to sanctuaries that also has a stone guide. Fast traveling without a stone guide can only be done if you have the item Calling Horn. Holding R2 while on a ladder lets you slide down it. I don't really know the right key for keyboards or any other controllers, so. Yeah, this beginner's guide is starting to not go well, huh? Always try to attack a chest before opening it. If you played a lot of RPGs, you should fully know what this means. If not, well, you'll find out. If you unequip all your armor pieces, you can perform the naked leap. Now, I've said this before, but if you find this, well, that's probably a boss battle, so. Hmm. Speaking of things I've said before, every zone is interconnected. Literally, there isn't a loading screen here. Try to explore every nook and cranny of each zone. A lot of hidden doors exist in this game, as well as hidden passages and hidden atoms. Hidden atoms? Hidden atoms. What? Hidden atoms, so. Yeah, there, explore everything because there will come a time that you'll get completely lost on where to go next. While exploring, you'll find these grave stones. Attacking them will destroy it and will show the player the recent death that happened in that location, warning you of what's to come. An alchemist lets you transmute your gear as long as you have the appropriate materials. You need to use a salt sword on a sanctuary to use local co-op function. Mages and clerics let you buy certain weapons and armor, spells and incantations, or prayers and miracles with gold depending on which creed you're on. If you change creeds, your devotion will return to one and you'll have to do the work all over again so keep that in mind. Using a crystal spear at the sanctuary will change whatever creed it is to what you're currently on. Another option is to use a stained page at another creed sanctuary to enable the purging of said sanctuary. However, you will have to kill the NPCs within said sanctuary including all the enemies that will spawn after. Also, you will be trapped inside once you do this and you will have to completely get rid of everyone inside to get out. Leaving your creed to join another makes you an apostate. This results in you being an able to return to the creed that you left. There is an NPC in the game that can forgive you of the sin, but this still returns your devotion to one. A leader enables you to do work for your creed by finding and turning in materials from certain enemies. Each creed has different requirements and completing one of these works will raise your devotion by one. Each boss has their own elemental strengths and weaknesses. This might seem obvious to some, but not to everyone. Usually there's some sort of hint left by other players on how to defeat them, so keep that in mind. If you still can't defeat them, go back, level up, upgrade your gear, and try again. You will have to grind for salts to do this, but that is the nature of this game. Each boss has a very specific set of moves that it will perform no matter what you do. You can block some of them or if you're fast enough, dodge them. But their move list is permanent. Memorize it and you'll be able to predict each one of its attacks. If you still can't defeat them, then just take a rest. Most of the time, it's not because of your character, but because your brain is just too tired to make strong decisions required by these boss fights. And I'm telling you, it's totally fine. Just take a rest, maybe take a shower or something, and try again some other time. Okay, I'm gonna try to record this in one cut, mainly because, well, I'm not really fluent at the English language, but I'm gonna try my best here. So uh, if I sound really stupid, it's because I am. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm not an English-speaking thingy. Okay, I'm gonna start now. Hey everyone. Oh wait, that's not right. Wait. <clears throat> 
Kamusta everyone, we recently achieved the 1000 subscriber mark sometime this past few weeks. I'm so glad and proud that we managed to do this. I couldn't have done this without any of you guys. You guys have been such a source of inspiration to me, not just for making videos but also for keeping my mind at ease. I tend to judge myself too hard to the point where I tell myself that I'll never be good enough but you guys... You guys managed to help me go through it. I mean, I still think about it, but seeing you guys... What? But seeing the positive comments that you leave on the videos help me... Helps me say... Ugh. Yeah, I can't... I, I can't do this in one cut. Okay. Where was I? Okay. Oh yeah, um... But seeing the positive comments that you leave on the videos help me... Stay okay and happy. Thank you so much everyone, I'll do my best to keep making content for you guys. I'm really sorry this one took so long because lots of stuff happened, college finals happened, there was some sort of projects that I have to do, a few anxiety attacks, I, I also get hospitalized but, but I'm okay now, I'm fine, don't worry, so yeah, it's all it's all good now. And also, because I, this one took so long to make, I'm considering reworking this how to play series because every time I make a new one I seem to get lost with a lot of information which causes this video to become really like super long so I'll try my best to keep it as short as well okay I'll try to keep it as short and concise next time since some of you guys are kind of requesting that I make it so again thank you so much for watching if you're new here you might want to watch my other videos I mean we have anime here guys like who doesn't like anime it's anime like the video if you don't dislike and dislike if you don't like it share it with mm, oh my god oh my god oh my god I can't talk I can't talk I can't. Mm. like the video if you don't dislike it and dislike if you don't like it share it with your friends and if you do like it Consider subscribing to the Phantom Heart for more. Okay, that sounded too creepy. I'll I'm Sis and thank you for watching.